am so pleased to welcome you all today uh, for the landing lecture for this year, and we're very pleased to have Dr. Enrique Iglesia as the 2015 landing lecturer. Uh, Washington State University civil engineering alum Jack Dillon, who graduated in 1941, established the landing lecture in honor of his late wife, Frances Lanning Dillon. The fund supports lectures that broaden students' knowledge of the engineering profession. So Dr. Iglesia is with us here today. He is the Theodore Vermillion Chair in Chemical Engineering at the University of California in Berkeley. He's a faculty senior scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab and director of the Berkeley Catalysis Laboratory. He joined UC Berkeley in 1993 after 12 years as a research scientist and manager at the Exxon Corporate Research Labs. Since catalysis is one of our strategic focus areas, it is particularly appropriate for Dr. Iglesia to speak with us. This group addresses the synthesis and the structural and functional characteristic of solids used as catalysis for production of fuels and petrochemicals, for conversion of uh, energy carriers, and for improving the energy and atom efficiency and the sustainability of chemical processes. His work combines synthetic, spectroscopic, theoretical, and mechanistic techniques to advance novel concepts and applications in heterogeneous catalysis. He has co-authored more than 300 publications and 40 U.S. Pat patents. He serves as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Catalysis, well, he did from 1997 to 2010, and currently as president of the North American Catalysis Society since 2008. Among his many honors, Professor Iglesia is a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a fellow of the American Chemical Society and the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, and an honorary fellow of the Chinese Chemical Society. So I just want to let you know that we have scheduled a time for students to interact with Dr. Iglesia after this lecture today. He's told us that he's particularly interested in speaking with undergraduate students. So I encourage each of you to use this opportunity to talk with one of the nation's leading engineers by speaking with him after the lecture. And so now I'd like to have us all welcome Dr. Iglesia to the uh, podium where he can deliver the 2015 landing lecture. So after this uh, slight technical difficulty, which will continue, I think, because um, the aspect ratio of this slide is not right. So I want to reassure you that all our nanoclusters are symmetric. Can you hear me in the back? Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. I want to first uh, thank the faculty of the uh, School of Engineering here for this very distinct honor. It is an honor that I think belongs to the very talented group of people who have done the work that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm only here as their uh, sort of um, adequate representative. Okay. Um, I'm going to do this with, with the trepidation of, of the academic that perhaps is expected to be more useful than we really are. Um, and I'm going to try to leave you with a story. I'm going to tell you about a journey, not in chronological order, but I'm going to tell you about a journey through a series of concepts that at the end have had what I call the intellectual debris of practical applications, which I will not dwell on, okay? But which I hope uh, will leave you with a message that understanding how things work and why they work a certain way will actually allow you to recycle that knowledge into problems that we cannot even envision today as being important our well-being. Um, so the, the talk that I'm going to give today is a talk about So I'm going to talk 
a, a little bit about, you know, what I'm calling catalysis toolbox, and it is what it is that you have at your disposal in order to be able to carry out a catalytic reaction. And I understand that catalysis may not be an everyday word in, in your lives, so I will spend a little bit of time at the beginning, you know, with some very simple concepts about catalysis that may actually be useful later on. But I'll give you a roadmap at the beginning, and the roadmap is going to talk about how things, as we move them from metals to compounds, and as we then change their size in doing that, may actually have surface properties that will lead to reactions be different as a result of changes, perhaps, in the shape of the particle, or changes, perhaps, in the number of atoms that you have in corners and edges that may actually have different properties that those in a ball in the explain. I'm also going to try to connect it to things that for those of you in the electronic materials may be more close to your heart, and that is electronic properties that by their sheer color are telling you something about where the electrons are in these materials. And then after I finish using everything that I can in order to make a catalyst work better, okay, I'm going to say at this point all I can do is design containers. Design places where I can put these nanoclusters and perhaps they will do something different as a result of being within those containers. So I'm going to put metal particles inside, and I'm going to put other kinds of chemical entities that perhaps can catalyze these chemical reactions. The, um, this is the slow slide. And I'm going to try to do that in the context of catalytic reactions, which for you, it's going to be the ability to take two chemical reactions and couple them together in order to make the material do it again and again and again. And I point out that these are not going to be the charismatic nanoclusters that you see in these journal covers that have all kinds of attachments on the surface. They have beautiful micrographs. Everything that I'm going to tell you is going to be about the down and dirty work of a nanocluster as it's actually undergoing catalytic turnovers. That's going to put some limitations on my pretty pictures, but it's going to perhaps bring it close to a relevant story. So the question is how, and for a very long time we have been asking the very descriptive question of how things work, and it is only more recently that we have begun to turn that into a deeper question, which is why they work that way. And it is actually in asking and answering the why that you're going to be able to take that knowledge and be able to recycle into things that you did not expect to find. So. The progress in catalysis, in my view, in the recent years has gone from going from the how to the why things work in a certain way. So this is the entertaining part of my talk, okay? The rest of it is not going to be. This is, this is my attempt at actually going from Yosemite Valley to the Yosemite Valley. And because I don't have a catalyst to be able to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to climb half dome and I'm going to drop on the other side, right? And of course, most of you that try to do that don't make it, right? And neither do the molecules that try to do that. So if you know how to read topographic maps, you know what a catalyst is, because a catalyst is effectively that thing that is called a trail. It is the one that minimizes the effort in getting from one place to the other. One notice that this catalyst that I have here has not changed the relative altitude between the two valleys, right? That's thermodynamics. I still have to climb 3,000 feet, but that's the easiest way to get there. And notice what a catalyst does is it breaks off what would otherwise be one very simple step into a series of steps. Each one of them will take you from one small mountain valley to the other one until you get to the end. Notice what you have done by doing this. You have ended up here. Right? You have not ended up there. So this is the issue of selectivity and heterogeneous catalysis. Not only does it make you get there faster, but it makes you get to where it is that you want to go. Everything is about the mountain passes. Everything is about these double daggers that I have here. This is why I bother you with this story. These are called transition states. These are saddle points that effectively provide the minimum energy path from the actors and products. And the role of a catalyst is to lower the energy of that transition state, to make them as low as thermodynamically possible. The rest of it is about how we do these trails by actually using the properties of elements that the periodic table has given us. We have a periodic table, and we have elements that sometimes want to mix and sometimes they don't want to mix. 
and we can mix them in groups of two or three, and we can begin to fill up this parameter space. And after we have done that, then we need to figure out what to do. And what we do is we change the size of that domain, and we hope that chemical properties will now proliferate in another dimension. Or we put it into containers that may change the chemical properties of the accessibilities of those active sites. This is sort of the roadmap for the rest of my talk. And I'm going to try to show it to you through several examples. The examples have no particular order and no particular chronology, except I'm going to move in this style of Western reading from left to right, okay, from the metals to the schizophrenic particles to the metal oxides and the metal sulfides. And then I'm going to go up, contrary to Western reading, again, talk about the container. So I know now, through the progress that we have made for many, many years, how to make very small particles of nanometer size of almost every element in the periodic table. I'm not going to do a service to the amount of effort that goes into doing that by just saying we can make it. And we know when we have made, it, made them, and we know that they stay that way during the reaction because we look at them before and after. Now we want to do a reaction of that particle. This is a reaction that is dear to many of you that are trying to activate methane is a reaction that leaves carbon on the surface and in the absence of a co-reactant cannot complete a turnover. But if you put a co-reactant that is able to donate a reactive oxygen to that surface, then you can now continue to do this again and again. This is what makes a catalyst the ability to kinetically couple those two steps in order to complete a chemical reaction without at any point along the way having to have consumed a site. These reactions have names. Reactions have large, large amounts of money that have been invested in order to be able to do it. And this is generally how we make hydrogen from fossil resources, methane in particular. In this case with water, in this case with CO2. Now if I carry out this reaction, and I'm going to carry out on a particular catalyst, and I look at the co-reactants that I use, I find with some surprise that they actually react at the same rate. I also find with some surprise that as long as I don't do it for very long, even when I don't have the co-reactant there, they react at the same rate. What does that tell you? It tells you that this part of the chemistry is going on very fast and that therefore all that you're measuring when you measure a rate is what a methane molecule does when it gets to the surface and it always finds that the co-reactant has cleaned up everything for you. It doesn't get any simpler than this. It is limited by CH bond activation as I can convince you by putting a heavier hydrogen atom and noticing that the rate is now slower as a result of doing that. We gave it two different names, but the two reactions actually are the same reaction. They're limited by the same elementary step. And is without knowing what that elementary step is, you can spend a lot of time doubling your effort, or you can pick one of them, steam reforming in this case, Notice that this is what we measure when we measure a rate and ask the following question. If a methane molecule approaches a surface and it sees a metal atom on that surface, what does it do? <coughs> well, what it actually attempts to do is interject that metal atom in the carbon-hydrogen bond and actually break that carbon-hydrogen bond. And you may imagine for a moment that the chemical properties of that element, where it came from in the periodic table, will make a difference. But you may also wonder whether a lonely atom in a corner of a particle would be more willing to entertain a methane molecule than one that is happily surrounded by neighbors in a flat surface. And of course, the unhappy atoms want to interact. And as a result of it, you expect that a particle that has facets such as what I have here, and where the relative fractions of the surface that are constituted by those different facets change with size, that there will be an effect of particle size. The question is in which direction? Well, so you can guess now because I have given you all the information that you need. You can guess that a small particle with more corners and edges will have unhappier atoms that will want to interact more strongly with methane, right? And as a result of it, small particles will be good. Well, let's do the experiment. Let's pick the periodic table. Let's do now Let's change the size, the mean size of these particles, keeping the element constant. And what we're going to do is we're going to measure something that we call the metal dispersion. That's a fraction of the atoms that are on the surface. And this is really a surrogate for size, with size increasing in this direction. The other thing that we're going to do is we're going to measure a rate, but we're going to be very careful because 
Every time that we change the size of the particles, we're going to change the number of metal atoms that are exposed. And therefore, I need to normalize the rate by the number of atoms to get a turnover rate. And that's what we're going to put here. So you know what the answer is. You know that as I make smaller particles, I'm going to have more reactive surfaces. And that is true for rhodium, and that is true for ruthenium. And of course, they came from a different place in the periodic table, and therefore, for a given size, they are different. It's also true for iridium and platinum and nickel catalysts, just something that is rather general. Whenever you find a surface that, for the most part, has been cleansed by the core reactant, the surfaces that have the unhappier atoms will actually react with the molecule factor. They will give you a more stable transition state. And it doesn't matter what the underlying substrate is on which we have put this particle. This is what happens if you repeat the experiments with CO2. You see that the trends are the same. What you also see is if I put one of them on top of the other one, you can't tell them apart. So two reactions, you've got a different name, actually have exactly the same behavior because they're both limited by the same elementary step. So corners and edges, which are more prevalent on the smaller particles that you have here, are actually more reactive. But notice what I have done. I have done something that I was told I could not do. I could actually change platinum and make it look like iridium. And I can change rhodium and make it look like iridium. I can actually do the transmutation of the elements now by changing not their chemical identity, but actually their size. So if you're business uh, inclined, you can think about how you can play the price of the precious metals in the market and, and perhaps be able to anticipate. What it means is that the properties of an element in the periodic table depends on how many friends it has nearby. It also depends on the identity of those friends. Okay, so now the question is the why. I have given you the hand-waving arguments as to why this may be the case. But we can actually take clusters of different size. We can build them into regular geometric forms in a computer, and we can begin to interrogate. We can begin to ask the question, how stable is a transition state? What is the CH bond activation barrier? As I change the coordination of the atom that is actually inserting in the carbon-hydrogen bond. And I can do that with any of them. And what I get is I get a general behavior that says that indeed, atoms that have a low coordination will have a lower activation energy than those that have a high coordination. And you can now begin to look for the first time and where the electrons are going as you go through this metal atom insertion into a carbon hydrogen bond. Now, I go back and I entertain you for a moment again by asking the question, why is it that a stronger binding atom necessarily has a more stable transition state. In other words, how does a methane molecule know that whenever it is that I finish dissociating that bond, it will be a happier product, right? So the way, the, the easiest way to look at that is to look at the simplest and childish way of looking at how a chemical reaction takes place along the reaction coordinate. It effectively says that molecules have to go through summing here, that is the crossing point, because in doing that, they have to fall and do that, right? So now, if this is the activation energy because this is the transition state and those are the reactants, the question is what happens if I make now a more stable product? I make it and sink it into a product. A simple geometric argument says that you have now crossed at a different point and therefore your activation energy is lower. This is a pictorial statement of what are called linear free energy relations. It says that thermodynamic at the end dominates everything that we do, and catalysis is only a way of moderating what thermodynamics really wants to do. In this case, we have failed with the product, and as a result of it, the transition state has noticed, because it is part of the way to becoming one of those products. Okay, so enough about this one here. I can actually give you another five or six examples of reactions at high temperatures where a bare surface that is more coordinatively unsaturated will actually carry out reactions faster. But what I want to do now is I want to uh, talk not about this. I want to begin to move to the right here and begin to ask the question, what happens as I now begin to form the surface of these particles? Because one of the co-reactants, for example, is remaining on the surface long enough to give me significant coverages. So what I'm going to tell you is that in these cases, what limits the rate of reactions in many cases is the reactivity of that heteroatom and also 
how willing it is to leave so that I have a place to land my molecule. I'm also going to try to convince you that you can make the same qualitative arguments and predict what it is that the effects of size are going to be. So this is the reaction that we have called wave forming. Okay, if I begin to put either more and more of those molecules, or even more effectively, I bring oxygen instead of CO2 and water. This is called combustion. I make CO2 and water now. The surface now gets heavily covered by oxygen, and the reaction changes, not in the rate-limiting nature of the CH bond activation, but in what it is that is activating that CH bond. So if you look at a methane molecule coming down, this is actually a transition state on a platinum 111 surface as given to us by theory. And what you see is that the hydrogen is abstracted by the oxygen. The metal atom is not inserting into a carbon hydrogen bond. This methane needs a couple of things in order to be able to react. It needs to be able to get to that surface. It needs to interact with that oxygen. This has to be willing to take the carbon and therefore, the two requirements that you have here is you need an oxygen that is sufficiently uncomfortable, that it wants to react. And you also want an oxygen that is sufficiently uncomfortable, that is willing to leave once in a while, so that there's actually a place for the methane to land. And with that, and, and only that, you can begin to actually predict what the effects of size would be on this particular reaction. A CH bond activation. The same elementary step, but with a different hydrogen abstract. So here's a particle. Here is a picture of the particle. Okay? And here are the places where the oxygen could be. Where do you think the oxygen is going to be most strongly bound? Corners and edges, right? Okay. So where is the oxygen going to be happiest? At a corner and an edge. Where is it going to be least willing to react? at a corner and an edge. Where is it going to be least willing to leave for the methane to come in? At a corner and an edge, right? And now you can begin to sort of look at oxygen binding strength, as indeed these numbers indicate. The binding energy is much stronger there. So now I go back to my crossing potential diagrams here, and I ask you the question. If I now are carrying out this reaction on this terrace, okay, and I, this is my activation energy for that hydrogen abstraction, and all of a sudden, you give me a corner. What should I do in order to change this diagram and try to find out what the activation energy is? I should stabilize my reactant, right? So when I stabilize my reactant, my activation energy goes up. That's the simplest explanation of what happens here. The question is, if this is what you measure when you measure a rate, the next question is, is this reasonable when I go and measure now rate constants for the reactant? I'm going to now increase the crystallized size this way, the stronger metal oxygen bonds are this way, and I'm going to look now at the turnover rate for platinum and palladium as I change the size. And all of a sudden, the small particles, regrettably so, because the small particles are the ones that use the noble metals most effectively, are actually for the most part dead. They do not work very well. They bind oxygen too strongly. This is also, by the way, why gold does catalysis only when it gets really small. Because gold is a perfectly happy element as a bulk material, but as soon as you make it smaller, it begins to want to interact. And as a result of it, as small particles, and only as small particles, it becomes an active element. And again, it's because the oxygen reactivity is lower on a corner and an edge, it's because it is much more difficult to find a place to land. Okay, so remember the reforming reaction that I showed you earlier? Okay, that's what it looked like. That's what this one looks like. So anybody that tells you that, that CH bond activation is a structure sensitive reaction, you need to specify what it is that you're measuring and what is abstracting it. There is no shortcut around figuring out what chemical event is the one that you actually are measuring when you measure a rate. You can't guess in spite of your better wishes unless you know exactly what are the limiting steps for that reaction and only then. Can you begin to reason, I think, and only then are you certain to be able to reason as to whether small or large particles are for a reactor. So those are all CO oxidations. Okay, so now with apologies to a famous um, Spanish film director, I'm going to talk about redox cycles on the verge of an oxidated breakdown. Okay? 
Okay? These are uh, places where this is not quite sure whether it wants to be covered with oxygen or it actually wants to become an oxide. In other words, we're beginning to cross the point where even a change in the reaction conditions could cause your material to become an oxide instead of a metal without you noticing what is going on. A reaction in which we were blindsided because we didn't know this was going to happen is one in which we are doing another oxidation reaction. It's not methane, but it's an all. This is the most important reaction in doing sel selective catalytic reduction, which is the method of choice for doing lean, burn, effluent cleanup in automobiles. You need to make NO2 to go into the fast mode. But we were actually interested in it because it was a natural progression from the methane oxidation. You spend a year or so trying to figure out the mechanism. It is actually an equilibrated NO, NO2 reaction that sets the oxygen coverage on the surface and then unusually oxygen activation being the rate determining step. For oxygen to activate, you actually want that oxygen to interact with that one and you need a vacancy in order to be able to do it. So now you know that small particles are not going to be very good for this because you need an uncomfortable oxygen and you need a place to land. And this is what, what you measure when you measure the rate is actually telling you. This is the oxygen binding energy term here and this is the place to land. Here's the turnover rate for this reaction. Here's the crystallized size. Which way does it go? Does it go that way or does it go that way? Right? Because this binds oxygen too strongly and that's what limits the rate of this reaction. And once you figure it out for this metal, it's very simple to predict that every other metal is going to actually do the same thing, right? So the oxygen binding energy is strongest there, so you're not going to have too many of those places for you to be able to do catalytic tunnel. So at this point, you broaden the scale here to a logarithmic plot. You broaden the scale here all the way to 100 nanometers. You begin to look at all these metals, and you're sort of comforted by the fact that at the end of this exercise, you actually find something that looks reasonably consistent. In all cases, and unfortunately, the small particles do not work very well. There is a problem, however. If you look a little bit deeper, in that the order of reactivity here makes no sense. Cobalt has the strongest metal oxygen bond of all these metals, and yet is the most active. Right? So at this point, there was a, a confusion as to what it is that was actually causing. You should be able to predict the order of reactivity after you have the negatives. Of course, you go to the synchrotron, you do X-ray absorption, and you find that, that your materials all be known to you and actually become oxides during the reaction, and that therefore, this is not the bond energy of oxygen on a cobalt metal surface. This is actually the redox potential between a cobalt 3 and a cobalt 2 that is actually driving the chemistry. At this point, this realization says that you can no longer look at these surfaces and begin to think of them the same way as we did before. Never mind the fact that it's difficult to characterize what the shape and size of these materials are. But notice how clever an alchemist we are now. Now we can take a metal and transform it into an oxide of another metal, right? And it does it because the oxygen chemical potentials are such that that is the stable form. So we're kind of stubborn, okay? So at this point, what do you do? Well, you take the rate of the reaction, you look at the standard redox potential for the oxidation states that you're cycling between, and you find that indeed, there is your Arrhenius. This is your semi log plot, and effectively says this is what matters. And the reason rhodium is not there is because the redox cycle that is actually going on here has actually not been measured, cannot be measured under electrochemical uh, conditions. So a different property of the material now all of a sudden became important. Okay, now we've had our breakdown. The materials were actually undergoing the breakdown under our eyes and we didn't notice until we found that inconsistency and at that point we had to check further. So now let's, let's go to a place where the breakdown is expected, is obvious, is actually used in order to carry out the catalytic reaction. Let's go to places where the elements actually will bulk oxidize. By the way, I could have given you a talk today about sulfides instead of oxides, and the story would not have been very different. Again, I'm not making the point that you can translate the knowledge be beyond its original intent, but in fact you can in this case. So let's look at a reaction that actually is called oxidative dehydrogenation. 
It is actually the reaction between oxygen and a paraffin in order to be able to abstract the hydrogen where it's CH bond activation to give you water and drive the thermodynamics of a reaction that would otherwise be thermodynamically unfavorable. This reaction occurs on elements from the periodic table that would never have a chance to be there as the metallic state and therefore they are well known to carry out this reaction in their metal oxide state and to do it with a redox cycle that normally goes by the name of a Mars Van Kravlen type mechanism. So this reaction takes place on vanadium, molybdenum, niobium, tungsten oxides. This reaction is limited by the rate at which a propane in this case actually is activated by an oxygen on the vanadium to form a transition state that looks like a radical-like structure there with a rate that is solely limited by this side of the cycle, as in the case of methane activation, with a rate constant that is effectively the stability of that transition state to that step. Okay. This is two years worth of work to show that this is the case. Now you get the answer in 30 seconds. <laughs> the transition state actually looks like a reduction of the metal center. In other words, there is electron transfer at the transition state into the unoccupied orbitals in the metal center of this metal oxide. And I can tell you how good a catalyst is from the color, which is sort of embarrassing, right? But in fact, it doesn't matter what element I put in there. I can pretty much look at one of these catalysts and tell whether it's going to be active or inactive. The white ones are inactive, okay? The ones that are true color over reduce and therefore they're not active and somewhere in between, so the Goldilocks story of catalysis is something in between is just right and it works right. Okay? So I have the ability which I cannot pass on to you to look at color, but there is a machine in my laboratory that is very good at telling color. And it's called a UV visible spectrophotometer that will actually tell me something about the electronic properties of the material. So this is my surrogate for color. It's effectively an excitation of an electron from this highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. That's how you get color. Light is absorbed in that case. So I can't see the particles. They're very highly dispersed. We put an oxide and an oxide, and we often make highly dispersed materials. And we cannot really shine an electron beam on them without actually destroying the material. So I'm going to use my ability to tell color by doing the following. This is the rate of this reaction. This is the edge energy. This is the band gap that you have in this particular material, which is not a bulk material, so it's not really a band gap, it's a monoluminal gap. And therefore, materials that have a large band gap are white, and they don't want to reduce. Materials that are here are color, okay, and they do accept you know, a certain number of electrons. I look at vanadium and I disperse it very well on a support, and I get a data point right there. Then what I do is I begin to put more vanadium on the surface with the idea that as I make my materials larger and larger, as the particle in the box problem would suggest, you actually end up getting more closely spaced energy levels. And when you do that, you actually get both an increase in reactivity and you get a lowering of the band gap. And this is vanadium on all kinds of supports, which I could not tell what the size was. Well, if I now go to the periodic table and I click molybdenum, okay, I find out that this is what happens when I change the surface density of molybdenum. And then if I get carried away and I go to the very poor catalyst here and I begin to look at Thompson oxide and niobium oxide, and if you give me the liberty of throwing a straight line through there, you can see that without even knowing what element I put in there, okay, I can actually go and look at the spectrum of this material and be able to tell you how active they're going to be. What does this say about humans? It says that humans want to see what things look like. And molecules just want to know where they can pack their electrons as they do in this reaction, right? And all along, we wanted to know whether it was a dimer or a trimer on the surface, where in fact, what really matters is the fact that the stability of that transition state depends on the fact that you're going to have to take the same electronic structure that you have there, and you're going to have to go to, go to that same energy level in order to be able to put those electrons. And as you make those energy levels lower and lower, it is both easier for that electron to get from order, but it is also less energy required in order to form the transition state. 
This is a little bit oversimplified, as most of you who are experts in the area will testify to, but in fact, it says that the electronic properties of these semiconductors, which is what make them quantum dots, okay, in the context of other semiconductors, is actually what determines to some extent their catalytic reactivity. So out here, the electronics matter because things that are oxides are usually doing redox cycle type chemistry that is invariably limited by the reduction side of that cycle. And as a result of it, you need to be able to inject electron density into the cell. At this end here, if you happen to be fortunate enough to be able to do chemistry on a bare surface, and very few of us get to do that in practice, what you find is that a surface that is bare will actually exploit its low coordination atoms in order to do the chemistry or effect. And if you find yourself somewhere in between, not knowing which way to go, you better figure out where you are. And after you do that, it's really the binding energy of that heteroatom that is covering the surface that is going to determine both its reactivity and its willingness to leave that surface in order to give the other molecule a chance to react. And after you finish the periodic table and the few things that we can mix together, you can actually get that third dimension and you can begin to get chemistry that would otherwise get somewhat boring if you just have the elements in the periodic table to do it. But after you do that and after you mix the metals and the oxides when they thermodynamic one and miss, and you mix two and you mix three and you mix four, okay, and all that, then after that you pretty much run out of the periodic table and you need to think of what else you can do. And tomorrow I'm going to tell you about much larger containers, okay? But today I'm going to tell you about the tiny containers, okay? The larger containers are going to be chemical reactors and things like that. Today we're going to talk about the container size and why it matters. And for those of you who may be more interested in synthesis and on... <coughs> I have caused, caused earthquakes to happen, but I'm not <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it makes sense. For those of you uh, who are more interested on nanopores, materials, or in synthesis, for the last 20 minutes of, of my talk, 15 minutes of my talk, I'm going to try to, to, to entertain you a little bit with, with why it is that anybody would want to do this to begin with, okay? And how it is that you can actually accomplish it if you do decide this is something that you need to do. So first of all, uh, let me go back to my mountain passes. As you may imagine, to the extent that these things that we call transition states have a different interaction with a container, they may be preferentially stabilized over the things that lie ahead. And as a result of it, you may be able to get not only higher selectivity, but higher reactivity. And I'm going to give you two examples. One of them is with sites, and the other one is without sites. And that one is more remarkable. Finally, if you're able to put clusters inside, there is a chance that at least visually you may think that you can keep these clusters from growing because they can't move past the window. That's a simplistic way to look at it, but nature actually is quite helpful. And I'm going to show you how stable clusters can be if you sequester them within this uh, structure. And finally, and this is the classic way by which zeolites, these are the nanopores, aluminosilicates are used, is by actually controlling what molecules can get in and can get out. And as a result of it, being able to react only what you want to react and being able to produce only what you want to produce. And these are the three ways by which we're going to use containers at the nanoscale in order to be able to add to that toolbox. That which I show you is given to you by the periodic table and by the ability to change the size of those elements in the periodic table. Let's talk about this one for a moment. I will repeat part of this story tomorrow for those of you who are going to be here, but I'm going to repeat it from a more practical standpoint. In this case, for you, this is curious, this is interesting, this is not practical. I have a zeolite. The zeolite here is called MFI. The zeolite can be actually put in with aluminum in a silicate structure that is crystalline I can draw all the atoms for you. I know where they are. I can do simulations on them. I can put an aluminum atom there, and I can counterbalance the net negative charge with a proton, making this an acid, which in contrast with sulfuric acid, I can hold in my hands, and it won't do you any harm. So these materials have very small channels of the order of 5 angstroms or so, 
And I've always wanted to do this reaction. You don't know why I wanted to do it, but you'll find out tomorrow why I wanted to do it. <laughs> this is called a carbonylation reaction. It makes methyl acetate. Methyl acetate can be hydrolyzed to acetic acid, one of the largest body of chemicals. And I'm going to do the unthinkable. I'm going to use this poor nucleophile and a proton in order to be able to do carbonylation, something that no one has been able to do. And I'm going to pick zeolites, because I have a storage of materials that over the years we have accumulated and sort of cataloged. And I'm going to do what you always do whenever you have a dream, a wish list. And that is, let me see what happens if I try the materials. It's reasonable to pick these materials because the molecules are small. The transition states may actually benefit from a smaller or a larger container. So we began to sort of take materials that have different funny names for those of you who don't work in the area. This here is a very large weasel core materials, and these ones are the smallest one there. The numbers here that will become relevant in a moment, this has to do with the number of oxygens in a ring that forms that structure, the beautiful structure that you can make. And then I'm going to measure the rate of carbonylation, and I'm going to normalize it by the number of protons that I have there. If this is acid chemistry, that's the way I should do it. And this is what I get. And this is disappointing. It's disappointing because there's no other regular trends that we were taught in science, you know, we should expect. You change something monotonically and you get one maximum rate and then you get the other one later on. And this did not make any sense. However, these materials were the most selective acid catalyst I have ever seen. They were stable for academic lifetimes, you know, two or three days and things like that. <laughs> <laughs> and it was worth understanding what was going on here. And, and here the movie sort of gets rolled forward. One year later, we finally figure out what it is that, um, that we're doing. So don't worry about being confused early on in a research project. That's a normal state whenever you have good news that you did not expect. <laughs> the rate of this reaction is actually, this is a change cycle that is initiated. It's beautiful chemistry. It's clean. It's the only chemistry that forms one carbon-carbon bond from a molecule that doesn't have one, and it only forms one. And it is limited by something that we mistakenly call a CO insertion. Actually, it's a backside attack, as you would expect from nucleophilic type attack uh, uh, reaction. It's limited by that step. The very good question is, every one of these materials has protons, right? But only these two materials have detectable rates. So a proton is not a proton, it's not a proton. It cares on what structure it is. But why in the world would it peak here and here? rather than give you a monophony change. Well, there was a problem, okay? And the problem was that mortonite, which was the best catalyst, has actually two structures. It has the highways, and then it has these pockets. And whenever we specify a zeolite, we never tell anybody where they should put the protons, mostly because they don't know how to put them anywhere, and I don't know how to tell where they put them, all right? So throughout the, the decades of use of zeolites, we have neither specified nor recognized the effect of location, nor have we tried to figure out how it is that we can put them in the right place. So now you go forward for another year. You have to develop a method to figure out where the protons are in this, to see whether it is one of the environments or the other one that actually makes a difference. So what we did was we developed a method by which the OH stretch actually is weakly sensitive to the location of the proton for this material because the environments are so different and you can actually count the number of protons that you have in the two structures. So I have a rate of a reaction and I have now a way of counting protons. How do I figure out which ones are active? I plot the rate versus the concentration of one versus the concentration of the other one, the one that gives you a straight line is the proton that is actually working. Here's the rate per gram. This is the number of sites in the eight member brain. And this is the rate in all the mortonites that we have looked at. I can now buy a mortonite and I can tell you how active it's going to be, but I cannot make a mortonite that has all of the protons in the right place. That still remains the synthetic challenge. So you have eight member rings, okay, here. Those are the pockets and you have eight member channels in there. Those are the pockets. If I actually count them in fairly right, they are on the same straight line. If I look at the, all the other materials there in the origin, they don't have any eight member rings. How do I know this is roughly right? Well, 
I can actually take that bottom location, this is the egg number of wind pocket in one night, and I can actually do a calculation. And what I find is that at the bottom of that egg number of wind, you have the lowest activation area. You have the most stable transition state. If I don't do it this way, for those of you in theory, if I just use the T in order to calculate it, these things don't look very different. As long as I turn on the Van der Waals component, or as long as I do an MP2 level uh, calculation, all of a sudden it pops off. So this is classic dispersion forces, weak forces, but with many contacts actually stabilizing that transition state. It works, it's practical, it's going to be used very soon. Okay. Um, this is confinement by Van der Waals interaction. I have a question for you. Suppose that I had a reaction that you have seen before. This reaction that you have here is one that almost takes place in the gas phase. It's actually a fairly straightforward reaction that is entropy limited. It forms a thermolecular transition state, and I'm going to try to see whether I can actually do it on a zeolite. None of these zeolites have any active sites. They're pure silica without any silos. I'm going to carry out the reaction, and I'm going to get very high rates on the smaller ones, even though there are no sites anywhere. The homogeneous rate is all the way down here, below the graph that I have here. There are no sites anywhere. These materials are extremely active. And look at the temperatures. These are room temperatures. We can continue to increase the rate of this reaction by lowering the temperature. It has a negative effective activation energy until the NO2 freezes in the zeolite and I can't use them anymore. And it is all because what you have done is you have taken a transition state that is normally in the gas phase and you have literally physisorbed it on the zeolite to lower its enthalpy by a significant amount. This is physical catalysis. There is no active site anywhere here. It's pure confinement by dispersion forces increasing the rate many orders of magnitude. Okay, so that's all about stabilizing transition state. Now, for those of you that I'm going to try to attract by talking about something that may seem different, this is about how to get clever about making materials, something that we're not particularly good at, but occasionally even the line squirrel finds a lot, right? Okay, so we were actually looking for a way of putting uh, clusters inside and we were actually trying to put clusters inside a zeolite, but we're contrarians. Everybody else wanted to put it on larger and larger poor zeolites. We actually wanted to put them inside the smallest poor zeolite only because no one had ever done it before. Not because we had any good idea what to use them for, but this was the last thing that was left to do. Right? So we picked a bunch of zeolites that no one thought were going to be very useful. Now they are. Okay, um, And we said, how in the world am I going to put a metal cluster inside? Certainly not by sonicating them. Certainly not by even bringing them by exchange, because once I have a high valent cation and a coordination sphere, there's no way I can diffuse through it, right? So the only way to do it is to actually have them there when I'm making the zeolite. In other words, you know, sort of uh, build the bottle around something that is small enough to be contained within the bottle. And you can't do that. You cannot pre-make colloidal particles that are half a nanometer. And they convince a zeolite to grow around. So you need to know a few things about the zeolite. And that is that these are geological conditions. Okay? I mean, these are very high pH, reasonable temperature, hydrothermal conditions. This is how the Earth crossed, you know, was formed, right? So there are not too many things that like to be at this high pH. Mostly all the noble metal precursors that we use to make these materials, right? So the first thing that happens when you do this is this thing's precipitate. And by the time they precipitate, they don't fit there anymore. So what we're going to do is we're going to protect them from precursors. We actually developed a screening tool that says that if they don't precipitate at these conditions, they will work. The question is, how do you get them not to precipitate? Well, you do it by putting ligands on it. You put ligands there that prevent them, the hydroxide, from displacing them, and therefore precipitating the materials. And those ligands are sometimes dangerous, dangerous in the sense that you have sulfur around, okay, or nitrogen, but they actually work extremely well for a wide range of metals of interest and a wide range of those small pore zeolites that I wanted to put them in. 
So I can leave it here, but of course I don't have the credibility with you yet to believe everything that I have said, so I'm going to show you that I can make small clusters, that the clusters are clean, that the clusters are stable, that only the small molecules can get to them, and that they actually don't like to center, even at very high temperature. So here's a micrograph. At this point, if I can turn the lights off, I will do it. But I think uh, these are pretty uniform in size, about one nanometer particles or so of these materials. Okay, now my credibility is there. You can turn the lights off. <laughs> <laughs> there are actually our particles here. Notice how honest we are. Most people plot this from zero to 20 nanometers, and they tell you how narrow they are. We plot it from 0.7 to 2.2 so that you can actually see this region. You can turn the light on. Uh, we can measure the mean crystalline diameter, and you, this is what happens when you do it by our method. The particles are much smaller than when you do it on a mesoporous silica. And if you actually take the mesoporous silica and you heat it up to reasonably high temperature, you actually get a growth of the particles. If you do it on all the LTA and the other materials, you can actually go to about 1,200 Kelvin, okay? And you can actually maintain this particle size. Now, don't ask me how it is that they form to begin with, because they form during the thermal treatment, but they grow to a certain size, they shatter a few windows, and after that, they don't grow anymore. But the question is, are they full of the same ligands that people are sort of using in order to grow these particles of a certain shape? How do I know that by surface? There is actually a very painful way to do this that our students are masters at, at doing, and that is, you look at this micrograph and you count and you say, if every particle there were clean, how many hydrogens could I find on the surface, right? And then you calculate the size from that measurement and the size from the TEM, you plot them against each other, and if they lie along the parity line, then everything that you see, hydrogen is seen, and therefore is clean. And what you find is that in spite of the fact that we use sulfur and nitrogen, the ability that we have to go to high temperatures in the treatment without sintering actually cleans the surface. But of course, the ultimate arbiter of whether a surface is clean or not is not any of these measurements, but is actually whether you can do a catalytic reaction or not. The reason we wanted to do this was to have certain molecules only get in and other molecules don't get in. So what is going to be the ultimate arbiter of whether we have succeeded or not? is whether we can get the small molecules to react and the large molecules not to react. That's going to become the measure of goodness and the reason why we needed to do this. So this requires that you look at sizes of molecules, that you believe for a moment that ethylene can get into every one of them, it can. Isobutene cannot get into any of them. And then you develop a methodology by which you can actually begin to calculate what I'm going to call an encapsulation selectivity. What you're going to do is you're going to measure on a unconstrained cluster the relative rates of these two molecules, because they came from a different place, they have different reactivity. And then you're going to make the same measurement, okay, but you're going to make it on something where only ethylene in theory can get it, and not the isobutene. The ratio of this on LTA to that one, which I'm going to define on the encapsulation selectivity, effectively tells you summing about the amount of surface that you have inside divided by the amount of surface that you have outside. This is a logarithmic plot. Okay, these are values that are all above 10 for a wide range of metals on LTA. This is what they look like when we use another ligand. They're also very selectively encapsulated. And finally, we can go and look at the other zeolites and they're even better encapsulated. The point is that by just preventing the premature crystallization of the precursor. You actually are able to template the zeolite around the precursor and then during the decomposition, you actually form these clusters that are reasonably uniform in size and extremely stable. If you use another reaction because it takes place over a wider, again, the same procedure, this doesn't get in, this gets in, we're oxidizing it. If you look at the same selectivity over a wide range of metals, some of them do not do hydrogenation, what you find is that all of them are above 10. So you have succeeded at encapsulating the Finally, if you want to protect your sites from molecules that are poisonous, as long as your poison is larger than your reactants, you may be able to continue to hydrogenate ethylene and the thiophene will never get there. 
Now, this doesn't work if your poison is smaller than your reactant, okay? But in this case, nobody has been able to run ethylene hydrogenation in the presence of thiophene, as I can show you here. It goes to undetectable levels. If I put it inside the LTA, it just drops by about 20%. Why 20%? Because that's as much platinum as we have outside in this material. And this goes on for academic lifetimes in a few days. I mean, it means it's completely excluded from the active site. It's not just this slowly. This is why we want containers, because they do things just as in the case of the enzymes, by effectively selectively stabilizing those things that have the greater van der Waals contacts with the surroundings. We also can make small particles. We can make them clean, accessible, uniform in size, and stable. Okay? And molecules have to get into small holes, and therefore only certain molecules can get in. This is how you add the toolbox that I told you about earlier. So this is what we use in order to be able to make something happen. Granted that I have, I, I have restricted myself to relatively small molecules in order to be able to understand the mechanism. You know, things get more complicated when you go to liquid phase reaction and so on. But there's certain rules that I think you can bring away from the specific examples that I have given you. And, and, and there's, in, in my view, very low in the amount of wishing that there are many other ways that you can change materials. You can change them from their chemical identity. You can change them by mixing chemical identities within nature's willingness to do so. We can change their size, and we can change what kinds of containers we actually put in those active sites. And in doing that, you generate diversity and flexibility that goes well beyond what one would expect if one had this just to do next to plant. So hopefully, I have made the points that I intended to make. Um, if you come to the lecture tomorrow, you'll see that some of these things will reappear again in the practical context of how it is that one converts the C1 molecules into something more useful. But for now, I want to end by acknowledging, as I did at the beginning, the individuals with whom we have collaborated and who have done the work. I also have to point out both to give credit to the supporters of this work, but to also try to bring some relevance to what I have talked to you about. The fact that 80% of all the work I've talked about was supported by two companies over a period of about 10 to 15 years in both cases, in order to understand the fundamentals of what is going on and then to turn them into practical applications. The academic providing the knowledge and presumably those who know what to do with that knowledge practice in a very inviting way. And the Department of Energy, who has also supported part of this work. Again, I want to say thank the I want to thank the audience. I want to particularly thank those of you who have stood on the side there. Okay, that shows great stamina. Even those of you that sat down in the middle of the night. <laughs> and also thank the faculty for this great honor and for the opportunity to tell your story that I hope was somewhat entertaining, even if not for a audience.